Hello and welcome to the second part of my Nurturing Educational Policy video series. In this episode, I'm going to identify the true underlying problem in education, but first I'm going to explain the psychology of faux achievement. The key to understanding faux achievement is knowing the relationship between learning and motivation. There is a spectrum of motivation that goes from more controlled motivations to more autonomous motivations. If you engage in activities to attain rewards or to avoid punishments, then you're on the controlled side of the spectrum. If, on the other hand, you engage in activities because they are consistent with your identity and values, or just for enjoyment, then you're on the autonomous side of the motivation spectrum. The further a student progresses towards the autonomous side and away from the controlled side means that we can expect them to do what matters the most in education. Show up, pay attention, and invest their time and energy in doing the work. It's obvious, I hope, that not showing up and not paying attention are going to cause problems. But you might be thinking, doesn't doing the work take care of itself? I mean, of course, if they don't do the work, then they won't get the grades. But if they just keep doing the work to get the grades, then mastery just naturally follows eventually, right? Wrong. Mastery depends on the highest qualities of motivation, what might also be called a good attitude. The highest qualities of motivation in students depends upon a combination of one, a sense that they are effective at what they're learning, two, a sense of connection to and acknowledgement by others in their learning community, and three, a sense that they are the source of their own behaviors and are voluntarily engaged in their learning tasks. These three factors are fundamental psychological needs in the same way that air and food are fundamental physiological needs. When some or all of these three factors are missing, then motivation of the highest quality is not supported. In fact, when these three factors are not supported, then the psychological well-being decreases as symptoms of anxiety, depression, and other forms of psychological distress increase. And it also turns out that controlled motivation is not sustainable. Therefore, in the absence of sustainable motivation, then the quality of learning is at risk of deteriorating. In Mr. Schuster's class, my attitude was not particularly good nor bad. I was compliant with the demands he made, and while my grades were fine, real learning was absent. When the quality of learning is low, then students will fail to attain mastery, as I did. If the quality of learning gets low enough throughout a student's school experiences, then quality of life will deteriorate as well. When the quality of life at school is low, then the student is unlikely to see any value in seeking the outcomes that indicate achievement in that environment. If the quality of life drops low enough, then the student will seek other opportunities that might be better for meeting their basic needs, which would tempt them to seize the day and leave school. In this way of thinking about the three questions I started with in part one, about dropouts, achievement, and failure to attain mastery, are all just symptoms of different degrees of severity for a single problem. A single problem with the ways that traditional schools tap into students' motivations. Given this understanding, the obvious solution to all three of the problems is for schools to support autonomous motivation. But that's where the deeper reality of how schools deal with children is deeply affected by educational policies that express and systematically reinforce certain societal expectations about the treatment of children, which tend to cause the thwarting of psychological needs and are, therefore, the true underlying problem. We live in a society that is distinctly uncomfortable with autonomously motivated people, especially children, and has created educational policies that systematically diminish the autonomy of everyone in the system. It also turns out that people who do not have autonomy do a very poor job of supporting the autonomy of others. So, current trends in the educational policies coming from on high which usually increase the degree of outside control of districts, schools, and classrooms, creates a classic catch-22 for frontline teachers who are near the bottom of the hierarchy in our school system. Competent teachers know what to do about the immediate problems that confront them and their students, which usually involves someone exerting more autonomy, even if it's just the teachers. But if they do what they know to do, then all too often the system will penalize them for it because of its bias for control and against autonomy support. My site, teachkidsattitudefirst.com, is becoming about how to organize changes in policy to address those symptoms at the level of the school, the district, and state and federal government by addressing the real underlying problem. The central challenge is this. How can we co-create systems of autonomy support to replace the systems of control that currently dominate our education system? My site includes some information about what it takes on the front lines, but the primary focus is becoming the systems 
and how to create a system of educational policies at all levels that nurture everyone involved. So now, let me reframe this discussion in terms of solutions to the real problem. Do your schools nurture the teachers and the children? Does your district nurture the principals and support staff? Do the education policies of your state and federal governments nurture your district officials? But I know that in your head you're really asking, is so much nurturing even reasonable to expect? In the third part of this video, I will discuss the role of educational policy and its relationship to nurturing.